had to come over here and do a little housekeeping. Clark's not been keeping my sticker clean. I don't know how the other guys feel about it, but I have to come over here and keep my own sticker clean. It's what ten hour trip to get here just What's to that? clean the sticker. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid it's going to get covered up like everybody else's with dust. Well, I fixed it. Hi, folks. Welcome back. Let me introduce you to Bob. Bob is a 1973 Bob lathe. I had one commenter lead a comment that says, if you don't understand how to pronounce the name of the manufacturer of that fine lathe, you don't deserve such a fine lathe. Kind of left me speechless for a minute. First off, there is so much controversy in the world and everybody thinks that they know how to pronounce the manufacturer of this lathe that I got tired of all the arguments. So I renamed it. This is Bob. You can tell by the I don't know if you can see down there, but I have uh, taken care of that problem with all the name plates, and so yes, I do deserve this fine lathe. What was that saying? You can they can have my lathe when they take it out of my cold fingers. Now tonight's video is taking you up on for part one of the Windy Hill Foundry uh, casting of the Tally Ho capstan. Uh, I was there for a total of four days this time and uh, when I left on day four we pretty sure we had a great casting and turns out we did. Now a lot of people are giving comments to say uh, well you we should have had a real foundry do it. Well, I don't know exactly what a real foundry looks like. Does it need to have $300,000 press machines and automatic sand machines? Does it need to have all metal flasks and a team of 400 people running around? There are uh, overhead cranes everywhere. No, a foundry needs somebody knows what the heck they're doing. A means to get cast iron up to about 3,000 degrees and something to pour it in that resembles the shape of the part that you're trying to make. There's a lot of safety risks involved and as long as those are taken care of, uh, I think anybody that knows what they're doing and has the basic requirements is more than qualified to make a part like this. Now, Clark is more than qualified to make parts like this because this is a kind of a specialty that he does one-off parts. If I need a part for an old obsolete machine that I'm trying to rebuild, send it to Clark. Clark makes straight edges. Now he didn't make these, but he is a... Uh, these are Richard King designed straight edges. But Clark pours the ones for uh, Keith Rucker now. And lots of other things. So, unless you know Clark, you really don't have an idea of what goes on at his foundry. Enough said. Now, this video and the last video brought up a few questions that I got to address. Mainly because people made a comment, wondered about something, or complaining about something that, like me, didn't know anything about. And the biggest one I saw was, you should have used a metal flask for the pour. Then you wouldn't have had that blowout. Oh, no. Puppy dog. 
Let's dump this. Well, I was standing there watching it, and we're all standing around kind of going, what do we do next? And I made the comment to Clark, well, I have some metal we could put on the outside of that wood box. That would stop that. He says, no, no, it won't. And I couldn't understand that until he explained to me, and I'm going to explain to you exactly what happened and why a metal flask would even happen. The pattern was made out of wood, and frankly, it, it, it was made in one way, and I think it was kind of like a prototype, but here, you pour this and this will get you this. But the problem was the outer ledge for the cores made the pattern about five to six inches wider than the actual part, and then you had to have sand on the outside of that, three to four inches of sand to take the heat. Well, man, you got about a, a 14, 18 inch cast right here. Now you add six more inches, then you add eight more inches, and pretty soon you run out of camera space to, to show you how big it was. Then you got to pick it up and turn it over very gently. Because it's just like a big old wedding cake. It's got three layers. It's made out of something that if you shake it too hard, it'll crumble. you got to start all over again. The pattern was made so that we had to pour a complete 360 degree object. It had an inside that was very complicated. It had an outside with core molds that went around it to make a, an, an indentation into it. And then you had a top that had a round nose on each side and then a, uh, an impression in the center. Well, all that had to be put into a box, ram sand into it, and then take it apart to get the wood pattern out. Well, that required three different layers of wood flask or outer container, whatever you want to call it. And sand was poured in and packed in layers. And there's a joint in between each layer that was there on purpose so we could take it apart. You put parting dust on it so that it doesn't stick to each other. So right there you've got an open pathway through the layers of sand to the outside. When we were filling the mold up and it blew out, the weight of the liquid hot metal, it is like water, rose and rose and rose until the hydrostatic pressure forced it to go out that joint between the two halves of the mold. The wood didn't have a thing to do with it. It could have been steel. It could have been titanium. It didn't matter. The sand joint could not contain the volume of hot metal that was being poured into it. That's why it blew out. As with everything, you know, just like SpaceX, how many times does it take to, to blow up the, the, the spaceship before it lands? Fifteen times. Clark redesigned the interface between the two molds to where it was now, instead of a flat plane, he beveled it. And so when we put the next layer of sand in, it made a joint that was like this instead of like this. So it helped hold the pressure over here. We also offset the pattern into the flask to give it as much room as possible on the outside for the pouring basin, which is what failed, to have a maximum amount of sand. Those two things made it work just fine. No other blades. Second thing was how many times does it take to, to pour this thing? Well, it took four. I think a total of six molds were made and four pours to get a good casting. That's pretty dadgum good. No offense to Leo, but it took him four times to fit the bow sprint. When you're making new one-of-a-kind things, 
it's not like printing something on a printer and say, oh, there it is. Even prints, you got to figure out the best way to support them and all that. So this is not rocket science, but it is an art. Tonight, we're going to start off with where the sand failed to release from the inside of the mold. And a little bit later, I'll show you what I did to help with that releasing. Hi, dollar! do is make sand. difficult this is. People looking at this round thing don't understand all the intricate shapes inside it. Yeah. A lot of surface area too. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me over the muller, but that's... What's that? I was saying I didn't know if they could hear me over the muller. No. But that is very intricate. And things like this here have very, very little draft. Like this one's real straight. This is a little more draft. Then over here, this is a little draft, but that's straight. And all this has to come straight out of that mold without breaking. Yep, so a finish is always super important as well. Yep. If you don't have a good finish, it takes one little... Uh, one little catch. One little cavity there that yep. doesn't doesn't have to be big at all, and it'll grab it. And then it's got all filled with metal. Yeah. That's a lot of metal. We're You're pouring 100 pounds of metal into this. Now we're going to get to the part of how difficult this pattern was to release out of the sand. Now, a year or so ago, I was over at Clark's, and I brought some, some very simple... Uh, patterns that I made for some rails. In fact, this is one of them. Man, it's nothing. It's got seven degrees of angle on one side so you can pull it out of the sand. It's just simple. It's long and skinny because I'm making a cast iron rail out of it. But I thought that I had done a wonderful job. Got over there, and Clark kind of scratched his head, and he said, well, I don't know if it'll release. I'm going, what are you talking about? It's got seven degrees of angle. You pull it straight out of there, and you're through. I didn't understand. When you're putting sand into a mold around a wood pattern, or any kind of pattern, this surface must be slick as owl snot, I guess they call it, being nice here, for it to release. This has got aluminum foil tape on it because my sanding job and priming and all that wasn't good enough. It took an hour and a half to get this out of the sand. And he sat there patiently tapping on it and finally got it out. And then we had to go to work and make it smooth enough to where it wouldn't tear up the mold again. He told me in one part some really, really, really tight tolerances that you need to sand this to. And what happens is, imagine in your mind a piece of sand. 
it's not smooth it's jagged it's like a piece of glass it's got sharp edges on it now pour that sand into a pattern here and pound it so that it all clumps together and sticks really hard and then take this out all those jagged little edges of that sand get pressed under pressure against this that's what him hitting on the side of the mold does it releases this by vibration well if it's got a tiny little sanding mark right here those grains of sand lock into it and, and, and it's hard and so the amount of force that he had to do on this was uh, I wouldn't have believed it till I saw it with my own eyes now take a round pattern with a whole bunch of intersections inside and here's a picture of it cram sand in there and ram it hard and then get it apart especially when there's not very much draft two of the sides in that part were, were a, a boss for a, a hole to go through were almost straight up very very little draft and so that hindered it also and the fact that it really needed some sand to go on to finish it or it wouldn't pull it looked great you could run your hand across it and well, it looks good but for that sand to come out it had to be better than good Clark put some uh, graphite in it and a slurry to slick it up and that worked but then I spent about two hours sanding on the inside of it so then we got consistent releases all the time it's more than you think And then once we get this rammed up inside here, we have to flip it over, put it over here, take it all apart, and put in some outer ring cores to make the complicated outside. I'll walk over here and show you. Not only does he have to pour this thing and get it out of the mold and take it apart, there's cores that we made to go here so that you get these lips. And then there's an inner circle. And then all of this in here. This one wasn't good enough. You know, and you don't know until you pour. This one had a cavity here. So coming out with a perfect one, the first two or three tries with a new pattern it's very difficult. And every bit of sand that we put in here has to come out. Yep. Without cracking. Right. Moving. Getting in the way of anything else. I need to check something. Pardon the dirt floor. It's hard to be coordinated. There you go. That ought to be enough. Okay.
It's funny how that sand can stand up to the boiling white liquid that cast iron is when it's at that temperature to pour. Yeah. I mean. Now you got refractories in the sand that help protect it. Because you're pouring something hotter than the melting point of sand in sand. I was shocked the first time I looked into that kettle. You're going to get some pictures of what it looks like inside there. It's fierce. Yeah. Now, personally, I've been inside many house fires. In fact, one of them I went into and uh, the roof collapsed on me and my team. And I looked up and it was like looking into the jaws of hell. Yeah. Well, when I looked at that kettle the first time, it was worse than looking at yeah. the jaws. I don't know what could be worse. But the, liquid, the, the cast iron is a thin, boiling liquid. Yeah. That surprised me. Now, I've cast aluminum and bronze and stuff. That's child's play compared to this stuff. Yeah, it's about like it's about as fun as playing with lead, isn't it? Yeah. This stuff. Anyway, that's that's my take on it. I don't all I know is what I see. In fact, last year when I was here pouring the rails from a project I determined that after looking at that that I don't need to be messing around with cast iron and so I, I brought Clark over my pipe and everything that I was going to make my own cast iron cooker with and I appreciate that and you appreciate it but I don't need it Clark God, God will, that's vicious stuff I will definitely be able to use it it's vicious. Now remember this picture. And this is what he's doing, putting all this sand in that cavity. And it's all got to come back out without breaking. Yeah. Without voids. It's darn near like black magic when you get a casting that complicated. And that's what this one is. Yeah. And couple that with the fact that it's a, a, a new pattern. You know, you, you said something about somebody said something that, well, a really established foundry. Yeah. <laughs> a well organized. A well organized. Well, folks, people, when you start running first off projects, on no matter what, how many times a do you failure. have to put a machine part through a machine to get it within tolerances? On certain castings, there's a, high, there's a very high failure rate in any foundry. Not just this one, but it's not. Uh, it's not a failure. It's not a failure. It is a. Uh, You're working out the process. It's a test to decide what to do, what not to do on the next attempt. <laughs> well, you even looked all around the internet looking to see if there was even one of these anywhere left. Right. There's not. Mm -mm. It has to be made. Yeah. And so you have to go through the process of getting yeah. it done. And, and you didn't make the mold. No. Or didn't the pattern. pattern. You've made the mold, but you didn't make the pattern. And I don't know if there's anything you would have wanted to change, but you just have to work with what you got and get it to working. Yeah. So we're working on Sunday morning here. Yeah, we've when, been uh, working since yesterday morning. Yeah, we worked till 1 o'clock last night. Did I mention that it was 30 degrees out here? Yeah, you did several times. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. I just see if you're paying attention. Yep, yeah, that's all I've been hearing you whine about, see? Oh. 
I sound like Don. <laughs> Don would have died. Yeah. <laughs> no, Don would have never come out. <laughs> He'd be watching you from the kitchen window, making sure you're okay. But like I said, it, uh, it gets equally just as hot out here. Oh, yeah. In the summertime. So I'll take the good with the bad. We're back. He started doing something else that, that was interesting. He called this hemming the edges. Yeah, that's what I call it. He's scraping it away, getting it level, putting the excess in the edge, and then pounding that in around all four sides, or eight sides. Yeah. And that makes it tight up against fills in any of the little voids that there are over there. Yeah, this will take care of that. And I just work my way around. I imagine this is sort of like sheetrock work in that everybody thinks sheetrock works pretty simple and easy, but it's an art. Yeah. And you got to do it a while before you figure out. Yeah, I can hang it, but it ain't going to look right. <laughs> oh, there's an art to hanging it. Yeah. I've had finishers come on a job and look at something somebody's done and refuse to finish it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, only six more sides to go. You're picking up on this side. All right. That picked up. Looks like it's stopping that way over here. Right here. <laughs> so if this will survive turning it upside down and not falling out we were, we we're gonna try it um, it's saying right there I'm not worried about that that's that's not going to be a problem. That's outside of the core print. So let me get my vent wire.
focus on the other side. Did you want to get all the dirt out from the where you poke the holes, vacuuming it? No, uh uh. What we'll blow it out when I turn it up on side. Oh, okay. Because I gotta cut the pouring basin too. If we get anything there. Okay. Uh we're done on everything here. I hope. Yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and stand this up. Right, everything's intact right now. Sprue hole is not visible. Now it's visible. That's What's that? Where, now it's visible. I'm gonna put the camera down. You guys have seen enough for yeah, right this yeah. second. I need both hands. You got it. Well, depends on how much you came up the riser. I got it as good as this gonna get. It's still there. Oh crap! But your riser goes like that, right? It don't matter. It goes down. Your, your uh, runner's not supposed to be down there. I it's think cooking. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Mm -mm. It'll be fine. <laughs> I know it ain't. It's gonna be fine. I've seen that happen too many times. It's gonna be fine. 